Good morning on this Saturday of, of Holy Week. We finish uh, the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel today, with chapters 30 and 31. Um, as you remember from yesterday, David and his men had been uh, sent home from the battle. Or, you know, they hadn't even gotten to the battle yet uh, against the Israelites because the other commanders were afraid that David and his men would join the Israelites. But on the journey home, I mean, it was, uh, it was on the third day of the journey that David and his men returned to, to their city, Ziklag, <clears throat> and found it burned and had been, had been raided by the Amalekites. Am yeah, Amal Amalekites. And all of their women and children were gone and their livestock was gone. And, you know, the, the, there was, they had, these Amalekites had totally plundered it and taken everything of any value. And David's men are quite upset by this, as is David, because his his wives are gone as well, and all of his properties. And it says that, um, verse 4, Then David and all the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. And I think about that. They, you know, they wept until they had no more strength to weep. And I think, you know, on this holy Saturday of of Mary, Jesus' mother, and the disciples, and Jesus' other close friends. He had more followers than just just his 12 disciples, or 11 left now after Judas. But I think about them and what they went through on this Holy Saturday. Did, did they too weep until they had no strength left to weep? And I know many people in today's world that have, that have done the same thing. They, they weep until they have no strength left to weep and other people that that hold it in that that say i got to be strong for everybody else and maybe they weep in private you know it's, you know um, where no one else can see so that they can remain strong but but when we mourn when when we when we're you know in that deep period of mourning we do we weep and we we get to the point of not knowing how we're going to go on and here this is how david and all of his men were and, and I think about this verse in correlation to to Jesus' death on the cross on Good Friday and, and to how those early disciples lived through, you know, Saturday, you know, the Sabbath, the Holy Day. Did they go to church this morning? Did they go to the synagogue this morning? What were the high priests doing when, you know, and all of that? But but I think of, of the depth of pain and sorrow, and, and I think that, you know, as we read this Old Testament lesson today, we can we can empathize a little bit more with David and his men because of what we lived through last night, Good Friday, just the remembering of Jesus' death. And it says that David was in great danger because his men were upset and were looking to stone him, to blame David, to look for a scapegoat. Again, a scapegoat. Jesus is a scape, was a scapegoat. But it says that David strengthens himself in his Lord God and he summons the priest and he has the priest bring the ephod in this, you know, one of the uh, deals that they use for worship. And it was then through this ephod, when this ephod was there, that David inquires of God, should I pursue these men? Um, shall I overtake them? These are the two questions. Shall I pursue this band? Shall I overtake them? And he, the Lord, answered and said, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them, and you shall surely rescue. So rather than, you know, tuck his tail between his legs and run and hide, David seeks the help of the Lord. And, and, and I think, too, of that's what we do. I mean, we seek the help of the Lord. We come to God with our hurts and with our cares and with our desires, and we seek the help of the Lord, and we gain strength in that prayer. We gain strength in that unity of, of family of Christian believers together that way. We gain strength from the Lord. And so David set out, and he and his 600 men, and they get so far, and 200 of them are so tired and worn out. They've been journeying. This is, you know, the, they journeyed, over two days to get back to, to their city and then the journey and more and probably without enough food and everything, but 200 of the men are just too tired, too worn out, too famished to be able to cross the river and go on. And so they remain behind and David and the 400 go. And they come across this young man who 
the other army had left abandoned because he was too tired and too worn out and too famished to go on. And he said he'd gotten sick and, and you know, he was the one of the servants of the leader of the group and they just left him behind. But David and his men have compassion. They don't just kill this guy randomly. They have compassion. They feed him and maybe a little bit of underhand. I mean, they, they, they get some information from him. They find out about where this band is and this young man leads them. Then he leads David and, and his band of 400 to where the Amalekites are camping out and they are partying and dancing and singing and just having a ball with all of the plunder and, you know, the wealth and the riches that they had at, you know, at virtually no cost. I mean, they, they went in and successfully raided that city and, you know, there, there evidently wasn't any, anyone left there to defend it. But... You know, this young man has has asked, you know, for, for protection that he might be able to remain with these. But don't turn me back over to this, you know, to him because, I, you know, my life will be worthless. But, you know, protect me. And David says, yeah, I'll protect you. I'll keep you safe. And and so then David and his men go down and, and they, they wait till twilight, you know. It's just getting dark. And it says that they attack from twilight until evening of the next day. You know, so a full day that they battled this, this group of, of people. And they were successful. And they, they rescued, they restored all of the women, all of the children, all of the livestock, and everything that they had, plus, plus whatever the other army had as well. It says nothing was missing, whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that had been taken. David brought back all of the herds and all of the flocks which were driven ahead. And the people said, this is David's spoil. But when they came back to where the 200 had remained behind, the 400 that went with said, they don't have any right to this. This is ours, you know. Uh, this is ours, you know. And and uh, it says, you know, and in David's wisdom, verse 24 um, it says, the share of one who goes to the battle shall be the same share as the one who stays by the baggage. You know, those who stay behind to protect will get the same share as those who go. And then at verse 25 says, from that day forward, he made it a statute and an ordinance for Israel. And it continues to this day. Well, David really wasn't king of Israel yet, recognized king of Israel. So for him to make this statute and an ordinance that would be over all of Israel maybe is a little bit premature in saying that, but but it does happen, and it comes to that point. So now we got to go back to the battle where the, where the Philistines are coming against Saul and all of his men in chapter 31 as we, as we look uh, at that. And, and during this battle, you know, God has abandoned Saul and, and has told Saul that he and his sons will end up dying in this battle. And it happens that way. And, and Saul finds he's been wounded. And his sons, three sons, it shows a list as, as having died. And, and Saul says to his armor bearer, take my sword and run me through so that these enemies can't come and kill me. I, I don't want them to kill me. But his armor bearer can't do that. So Saul falls upon his own sword when he realizes that the battle is lost and that you know he has no hope. He basically takes his life. Uh, so that he will feel, you know, less dishonored, evidently. I don't know. I don't understand that completely. But, you, you know, not wanting to be captured in that. And then the next day after the battle has settled down and uh, the Philistines are going through the spoils of the battleground, they come across Saul and his sons and they says that they... They, 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 they decapitate Saul. They cut his head off. Grizzly, gruesome stuff here going on. And they take, they take Saul's head back and they hang it on the wall so that all can see that Saul for sure is dead. You know, and um, they stripped off his armor and they carried it, you know, and, <clears throat> and it says they fastened his body to the wall. But when the inhabitants of this city heard about it, all the valiant men, it says, went out, traveled all night long, and took the body of Saul and his sons and went and buried them. So this is the end of the kingship of Saul over Israel. A gruesome, grisly ending for a man who 
who the people had clamored. They wanted a king. And this man whom God had chosen to be their first king, but this man who was indeed a human, sinned against God and fell out of favor with God and refused to listen to God. And this is at a point in time when, you know, when, when it, it seems that God's heart was hardened against Saul. I mean, um, yeah, and I, I, I look at God today and, and I think you know, God is a, he is a forgiving, loving, gracious God that no sin is, has been a, you know, it's, there's nothing that has ever been done too long ago for God to forgive. There's nothing too great for God to forgive when we come to God. And, and so sometimes in this Old Testament, we do see God being the God of, of vengeance. Um, but through it all, we see that, that he is always faithful to his people Israel. He has chosen his people Israel and even though they end up with some leaders that are faithless and lead the people astray, God continues to be faithful. And we'll find that out for sure again tomorrow morning as we greet each other with Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed.